Hello everyone. Welcome to Fresh Concrete. This is the second of this year's Fresh Concrete events, which is produced in collaboration between the Concrete Centre and the Building Centre. My name is Elaine Tugard. I'm Director of Architecture and Sustainable Design at the Concrete Centre and I will be hosting today's event and introducing you in just a minute to our speaker. I can't wait. Um, so this online series has been created to share just some of the wide ranging innovative practices and two types of concrete that are emerging to address climate change. And these are technologies that bring a fresh, a fresh approach and a fresh thinking to the way that we make and we use concrete. So, so the recordings from last year's series are now all available online to look through and you can see them on these links on the screen. If you haven't already, I urge you to take a look. There's some really interesting and thought provoking innovation in the manufacture and use of concrete in construction, including carbon capturing concrete, graphene enhanced concrete, a structural design uh, that's uh, been developed to be uh, de and reassembled, self-healing concrete designed in uh, a form to enhance biodiversity, and also concrete that can help passively charge vehicles that, you, that drives over it, and also 3D printed concrete. Now, 3D printed concrete is also the subject of today's talk again, but this time really pushing the boundaries uh, of, of what it can do for us in the creation of structural beams. And I am delighted uh, to be welcoming Andy Coward, who is founder of Net Zero Projects and Minimass, to explain his innovative structural solutions, its benefits and the opportunities that it can offer. Now, while Andy just gets himself ready and starts to share his screen, I, um, I will remind you that there will be time for questions at the end of this session. And so uh, as we're going along, please do put your questions for Andy in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And I shall endeavor to ask as many of those as I can at the end. Now, if we don't manage to get through all those questions, uh, we will share that list with Andy afterwards to respond to you directly. So if you uh, would like to do that, then please do. If you don't want a follow-up question, then please uh, just ask your questions anonymously or let us know uh, when you write your question. So I shall now stop sharing and hand over to Andy to better do that and welcome him. Put his fantastic. Andy, welcome. You Thank you very you. much. Excellent. So you're there. So brilliant. So I shall now hand over to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, uh, please, uh, uh, over to you for the presentation. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Hopefully everyone can see me and hear my, uh, uh, see the screen there and uh, hear me as well. So I'm going to talk to you today about mini maps. This is an approach, hopefully, that uh, many people will recognize trying to do more with I'm a structural engineer by background with over 17 years in the industry. I was at uh, the University of Cambridge in the early 2000s before going, unlike most of my uh, peers, unfortunately, going into the uh, engineering industry and joining AECOM or, or Oscar Faber as it was then, which shows how old I am. I moved from there to Foster and Partners where I was part of the in-house engineering team with, uh, with them working on projects all around the world, which was a very uh, uh, lucky position to be in. And then a few years after being at Foster's, I was uh, moved to Copenhagen, where I joined Bjarke Ingels Group, also an international architecture firm, and uh, rising to director of engineering at BIG, uh, until the point at which I started my own company in late 2021. So that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. So to set the scene, I'm sure we talk a lot, certainly in the concrete industry, but throughout construction about two of the big challenges that we face. One is cost, uh, and everyone talks about cost almost all the time. The other is now carbon, which um, when I first started work, wasn't something we talked about at all. And is again, now something we talk about a lot. So I'd like to say that as a designer, um, I would now focus on both of these aspects uh, uh, just as much. The Concrete Center is at the forefront of many of these things, uh, in particular to do with concrete. So specifying sustainable concrete is something which uh, we should all have as a document on our desks. 
Uh, but if you don't, I'm sure you'll be able to get hold of a copy. From my point of view, the way that I have chosen to address cost and carbon is using my background as a designer. So I'm not a material scientist, which means, unfortunately, I can't invent low carbon concrete or zero carbon concrete, but I wish I could. Uh, I'm not a sort of robots guy. I'm not a, uh, a, a software program or any of those things. I'm a designer uh, and I'm confident with the codes and, and all that. So my approach is to use less, use less materials, use less labor. Therefore, you have less cost and less carbon. Uh, simple really so just in a very brief way this image shows an example of one of the members of the family of mini mass beams specifically beams which could without doing anything to mat the materials give you up to a 70 percent reduction in embodied carbon compared to a similarly performing concrete beam and up to a 50 percent material cost reduction so here is a slide I like to show on every presentation. I sort of shoehorn it in everywhere I can, because these are some of the most fantastic structures from my point of view, built during, I think all of them, during the, or, or certainly most of them during the 20th century. Yes, that's right, most of them during the 20th century. Uh, and the thing which joins these structures together is their fantastic use of in-plane forces, tension and compression, rather than relying on bending. Bending is a habit that uh, I would say the engineering industry got into in the late 20th century when materials became less expensive and labor became more expensive. Well, we're at a, a point where I believe the situation has switched again. Because of carbon, materials are becoming more valuable. So we need to start thinking about how we can use materials in an efficient way and get back to the kinds of fantastic geometries that we're seeing here. So what is Minimass? Well, first of all, I'll tell you that it's inspired by work that's gone before. As soon as anyone invents anything, they realize pretty quickly, and certainly this was the case for me, that actually you haven't invented something, someone got there before you, and that is, in truth, a very reassuring thing, because it means you're not going crazy and you haven't uh, you haven't sort of fallen off the map. So here are just a few examples of bridges that, at a very large scale, do exactly what I'm trying to achieve with Minimass. They are separating uh, uh, tension and compression elements, so they are achieving a bending structure by using tension and compression. And that's, uh, that's the principle behind Minimass. This on the left here, Eurocode 2, figure 3.5, should be seared into the minds of all concrete designers. Uh, so hopefully you recognize it. This is the idea of um, the rectangular stress block distribution and where your compression and tension goes. So even if you don't realize it, when you design a bending structure, you are in, a, in effect designing for tension and compression, certainly at the ultimate limit state. So if Eurocode 2 suggests that the concrete below, effectively the below the neutral axis, is ignored, then the question I ask myself is, can we remove that concrete that we're not using in our strength calculation? You could say, well, I'm just in a roundabout way describing a, another type of truss. So is this another type of truss? On the screen, this is not a concrete truss. This is a steel truss, uh, of course, a rail bridge. But yes, in some senses, Minimass is another type of truss because I'm trying to shape the geometry to match the applied loads. But it's not a typical truss, certainly because most trusses that um, what one would design would be out of steel or perhaps timber. They wouldn't typically use concrete because the history of concrete tr trusses is, is sort of not very widely spread, uh, typically because connections are difficult, reinforcement is difficult. The other thing that, uh, so I'm trying to use concrete specifically for compression because that's placing the right material in the right place, but also because I'm also trying to avoid tension in the web members. So your, your standard 
rectangular truss uh, would end up with alternating tension and compression in the webs. Uh, and I'm looking for something that has compression only. And I do that using uh, graphic statics, which again, I, I'm sure is familiar to many of the people uh, on the call today. Graphic statics is a very powerful concept tool. I wouldn't describe it as, as anything that would go into detailed design necessarily, but for concept and for geometry generation, it's fantastically powerful. Uh, and I, I have um, sort of fallen in love with it to, to a certain extent. And this on the page is the constant force truss, which does exactly what it says. It enables you to generate a geometry that gives you a constant force in your bottom cord. In, in this case, tension, uh, constant tension force in the bottom cord, des described by the blue line here, um, uh, which responds to a uniform load. The nice thing about the constant force truss is that the red lines, everything else, the web members and the top cord are in compression. Uh, and so that achieves part of what I was trying to achieve with Minimass to have tension in the bottom and compression everywhere else. The other nice thing about graphic statics is, is that it allows you to explore different geometries under different loads. So if you had, for example, uh, not just a uniform load, but a point load like a transfer beam, you could vary your geometry and still maintain a constant force in the bottom cord and still maintain a, a compression in the rest of your geometry. So here we go. When you apply that type of thinking to a mini mass beam, it is possible to generate these two families on, on the left and in the middle, which are um, concrete trusses, let's call them mini mass beams. They have a concrete top cord, a steel bottom cord, typically made using post tensioning uh, strands, and concrete webs to separate the steel from the concrete uh, in the top cord. Uh, the geometry of these can vary depending on, of course, the length, but also depending on the applied loads. Um, I've indicated them as two families, MM01 and MM02, because there are two different possible approaches to how you might consider the concrete itself. So on the far left is something that I've indicated as unreinforced. So that would be applicable to concrete where we're using Chapter 12 from Euro Code 2, which would be plain concrete. So there might be a little bit of reinforcement running along the length of the beam to allow you to lift it up and for, for moving it around on site and robustness and those sorts of things. But basically, at the ultimate limit state, it's taking its compression capacity only. And it could be a piece of masonry, it could be a piece of stone, it could be glass, it could be anything that can take compression. At the ends where the steel joins the concrete, uh, there would be bursting reinforcement for, for the, the high transfer of forces, and that would be detailed in the normal way. So, so there'd certainly be reinforcement in those locations. In the middle, there is another version where this can best be described as a reinforced concrete version of the mini mass beam. And that's where we would be following all of the code requirements uh, in Europe 2 for reinforced concrete. Um, and so we'd certainly have reinforcement along, along the the top cord. The two would be broadly speaking applicable in roof situations uh, for the unreinforced version and in floor situations for the reinforced version, typically because the stiffness of the reinforced version is, uh, is significantly greater than the, the stiffness of the unreinforced version. On the right there, you have a traditional concrete beam. Each of these three sets of images has the same performance requirements, so response to the same loads over the same spans. So you can start to see a significant saving in concrete material and steel material in this case. So I've been pretty careful so far to avoid using the phrase 3D printing uh, because everything I've described up to now can be achieved uh, purely through geometry. It would be possible to make, if you had a precast factory that, that, that was set up in such a way, it would be possible to make a mini mass beam using precast techniques, or indeed in situ if you had the time and the labor. Um, so that's worth pointing out. However, I have gone down the route of 3D printing because I think it's it, it offers fantastic opportunities 
to create expressive structures using complicated geometries without the cost of the labor, and certainly with a, a very fast turnaround time, uh, mass customization, if you like. So the, the evolution of the industry from in situ to precast, I would propose that the next step is a 3D printed future. So here is a version of 3D printing. I'm sure many of you have seen images such as this online. It's uh, reassuringly calm, if you like, um, but just like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. This is a version where you're able to place reinforcement along or across the length of the print, but not through it. So this would be something which you could describe as unreinforced concrete, because in this orientation, you can't put shear links in it. So it wouldn't uh, necessarily pass those, those values. But this would be a version where you could place reinforcement. So this is a different geometry. It doesn't look like a beam. Uh, and certainly, if anyone wanted to know more about why this shape is how it is, I can talk about it at great length afterwards. But uh, let's say this is a second version where we're printing the perimeter of a geometry. Uh, and then we're able to place reinforcement inside the perimeter or within the perimeter and fill it up with concrete. So the best way to describe the, the version for a reinforced concrete mini mass beam is that we're printing a permanent formwork that we then fill with uh, rebar and um, with uh, concrete. Concrete, which could be the same mix as the print itself, or indeed it could be a different concrete mix. For example, if you have uh, something with a particular low carbon concrete, uh, concrete mix. It doesn't have necessarily a very good finish when you start off by printing it. It's worth noting that this is printed concrete, not mortar, because we're using a 10 millimeter aggregate. So it is actually concrete with additives rather, rather than a, a sort of complex mortar or grout. You can see here with the flaps on the printer, then, uh, then we get this nice smooth finish. This is using machinery from Cobod, one of the big uh, 3D printing manufacturers and working with a company called HTL Technologies. There we go. And when we uh, add all of these things up, then, then uh, the sort of value proposition here is that for like for like performance, in this case, a nine meter beam and a nine meter spacing supporting office like loading, a mini mass versus a traditional reinforced or precast concrete beam, we can generate uh, a reduction in concrete of around 5,000 kilograms, five tons, a reduction in steel in the rebar of, of around sort of 400 or 500 kilograms, and an overall reduction in body carbon of up to 70%. This uh, is a bit more detail about how these things work. So in the, in the case where we're taking the top cord as a reinforced concrete member, then uh, the graphic statics implies that you have point loads at the nodes. That is not uh, a very realistic case. In most cases, you would have a uniform, uniform load. So in, in actual fact, you do have some bending moment in the top cord, but the bending moment on the left hand diagram here is, is the critical thing because the, the dashed black line is your typical WL squared over eight uh, beam span bending moment. And the solid red line there is the resulting top cord bending moment. So we're designing our top cord for a compression force due to the push pull and a significantly lower bending moment. So the reinforcement therefore in the top cord is less. Interesting to point out that the dashed red line on the left hand side is the, uh, the bending moment associated with uh, the live load applied to half of the span. So that's, that's the typical case when you have half span loading, a sort of pattern load, and that can, that can be the thing which governs the design. On the right is the shear. Uh, because of the inclination of the cable, it's actually the cable which does the majority of the shear work. So you have a massive reduction in the peak shear that you have to design the concrete for again. So that means we're, we're able to be very efficient with the, the shear. I won't go through this in great detail, but there has been the independent cost comparisons done. So for that same nine meter mini mass beam or supporting the same loads, the cost uh, on site is roughly three and a half thousand pounds for a mini mass beam. Um, this was as of January 2023, around 5,000 for a steel beam. 
five and a half to six thousand for a traditional precast concrete beam and uh, something like 12,000 for a glue lamb beam. So glue lamb at the moment, the information I have is that it's off the map in terms of cost, but uh, mini mass is cheaper than the alternative. So we get onto some details here. Worth saying that mini mass is not really appropriate for very short beams. If depth is the most critical thing, then stick with steel. You know, if you're building a house and you need a joist or a, a, a you know, you take an added a, a, a wall or something, then steel's the answer. If you get to the six to 12 meter lengths, then mini mass is very competitive. And longer than about 12 meters where self weight really becomes important, then mini mass is an excellent option. Fire is very important with the exposed cables below. Uh, it's possible to have uh, sheathing for these PT strands, which has an embedded in intumescent layer. That's quite common in the US and it's certainly used in seismic retrofit over there. It's more common in Europe to use grouted PT. So certainly it's possible to place the cables within a duct and then a second duct around it that you can then grout uh, and that will give you the, the, the cover that you require. It would be possible to apply a coating on site, but that's, uh, that's a pretty awful job. In terms of details, the version I'm going for at the moment is a, is a kind of composite where the, the slab, if it's concrete, is using is part of the top cord. You can then pass your services through the webs. Similarly, you can work with CLT. I think CLT and Minimass is an excellent hybrid option because that would really allow you to drive uh, carbon out of the structure, but release yourself from the, the six meter grid that a, a typical CLT um, block building has. And then there would be details at the end connections for tie forces, robustness, all of the usual sorts of precast details. A couple of case studies, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll, I'll, I'll whip through these as, as fast as I can. It looks like the first building, uh, first uh, structure that will be built is going to be a road bridge in Ukraine. So up to, up to now, um, the, the, the business has been in, on an R&D footing and we're, we're now moving towards pilot projects. So this is likely to be the first bridge. It's uh, uh, eight meters long in terms of, um, bridge band, so it's not a big one, but it's designed for full full road loading. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, as part of a, a reconstruction project um, in a war zone, so we're designing for very heavy loads. But it's, a, it's allowing us to span twice as far within the same depth as the previous bridge that was there. This is the kind of detail that we're looking at. So it's, it's definitely a hybrid construction where we have our 3D printed beam uh, uh, as part of the, the depth and then um, a sort of lattice slab, biscuit slab sitting on top that we, we cast up the concrete. A second um, case study is for a building here. One of those situations where you have residential on top of retail and you have the, the challenge of changing your grids so that you, you no longer have the, the dense structure that you typically have with residential running through the retail. This was designed with a concrete flat slab as a transfer slab. Now, if we want to save carbon, there are many solutions for reducing carbon compared to a, a thick concrete flat slab. So I'm not suggesting that Minimass is the only one, but Minimass is a good one because it does allow you to switch to something uh, with a lower carbon footprint in the slab structure like CLT or like um, hollow core. Uh, but it also allows you to, to tune the uh, the deflections uh, and and the stresses in the in the cables to pick up the the permanent loads from from the transfers so so that's very positive and therefore if you wanted to you could span further and remove remove poles. The last thing just to touch on is that there has been quite a lot of physical testing that's gone on. Uh, I've done load testing uh, at laboratories in uh, the Danish Technical University in Copenhagen. Uh, and I've also done a fire test, a uh, significantly fire test over in Belfast with Effectus, the company. Um, and so we did a, because the furnace was two meters long, we did a two meter long beam with a 20 kilonewton point load. So not very heavily loaded, but uh, uh, we did a, a small beam that was exposed without any fire protection. So no coverings to the cables uh, for 132 minutes at 1100 degrees C. 
And it performed very well. It uh, showed very few signs of, of damage. Partly, of course, that's because the load itself wasn't very high, uh, and partly because it was able to transfer the load from the uh, forces in the steel as the steel re reduced its its strength to to the concrete itself. This is what it looked like. Well, this is what half of the beam looked like after the test. So you can see it's something's happened to it. It looks a bit it uh, looks a bit rough. The steel is a bit rusty. It's it's definitely affected by the 1100 degrees C, but it's remarkably good condition. No spalling uh, and and no sort of major uh, deflection cracks or anything like that. This was on display at my stand at Future Build, if anyone was there earlier this year. Right, uh, I'm going to say that's that's the lot and uh, open it up to uh, name for questions. Thank you very much, Andy. That was uh, excellent. And if you could stop sharing your screen uh, and then we'll uh, I'll ask you some of the questions, if that's all right. So great. Excellent. Um, so uh, we've got a we've got a few questions here, which I will run through some of them. There's there's quite a few. There's a lot of interest, I'm happy to say. Um, so uh, I'm going to So first one is, uh, does the Minimass beam require more steel than a conventional beam? Now, I don't know if that is referring to a steel beam or a concrete beam, you might be able, but also have you factored that into the calculation with your net carbon gain or loss? So. Yes, certainly looked at um, comparisons and I have tried to be as strict as I possibly can in terms of comparisons. So. Uh, a reinforced concrete versus mini mass beam, there's definitely a reduction in the quantity of steel in terms of mass. Uh, there's less rebar. I, I know there is a switch from rebar to PT steel, which comes at a higher cost and a higher carbon, but because it's such a significant reduction in overall mass, there is still a, a reduction in, in carbon and cost associated. Compared to a steel beam, then it's, diff it's more difficult to make a, a direct comparison in terms of mass of steel versus mass of you know, rebar, uh, but there is still certainly a reduction in carbon. So it's not as much as 70%. What I've found is it's more like 40 to 50% embodied carbon reduction compared to steel structures. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, how does mini mass react with vibration? Is that something that you've uh, yes. looked at? Very good question. Uh, of course, because we're taking uh, some of the stiffness away, that you know, a, a large rectangular section is stiffer than a, a T section, then uh, in principle, uh, it is worth performing under vibration. But really, what that means is that vibration becomes a more important um, load case to check when you're designing the structure. And uh, the big thing about that is that you can't really consider beams on their own anymore. You have to think about the system. So the floor slab plus the beam supporting it to, to generate the vibration performance. And if you replace a concrete beam uh, with a mini mass beam and you still have a concrete slab, uh, typically you'd have enough mass still to get a good, good uh, concrete uh, vibration performance. Okay, thank you. I think that answers to some extent another question about the, the dynamic behavior of it. You're talking about it acting as a That's system. right. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, there's a question there about uh, that they said that there that there wasn't any reinforcement shown in the legs in your MMO2. Um, um, I must admit I missed that bit. Does that yeah, make sense good, to you? Good point. Is that due to the size of the elements? So it is possible, it is certainly possible to put reinforcement in. And in, indeed, in the bridge that I've been designing, I have decided to put reinforcement in. Um, However, it is also justifiable to 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 avoid it. Uh, there are uh, because those those legs are always in compression, and so it's a case of checking for various things like tensile splitting and uh, you know out of plane bending and all of those things. But uh, it's a sort of eagle-eyed viewer. Uh, certainly, when it comes to the, the bridge that I've been designing, I have put reinforcement in those. There are so many questions coming in now. Um, I'm going. Uh, I think we'll be answering well great one for you to be able to answer them afterwards there's a couple there was um one I did want to ask was was about the depth and uh, you mentioned that a little bit with regards when you were comparing the 
potential lengths and the suitability and the transfer slabs. How does that compare? Because, um, is yes. that something you can talk about? Yes. Um, so again, as a comparison, I'm pretty careful to make sure that I stay within the depth on envelope of whatever I'm comparing to. Uh, but it's worth saying the span to depth ratios that you might be familiar with with traditional concrete beams, whether it's span over 20 or span over 15 or whatever you might aim at, it's pretty similar with mini mass. Uh, I found that um, when you have a high live load, you've got to have a, 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 a you've got to tend towards the lower end of that range. So it would be somewhere in the span over 12 to 15 if you have a very high live load. And if you have a high dead load, then you can push it up to span over 20. Excellent. And um, I think I'm going to there are there are too many for us to go get for questions to go through i'm afraid but i'm going to end with um the question about uh very exciting to see a pilot project starting to come through in ukraine any uh starting to be thought about but in the uk at all well i'm trying, to talk trying about very it. hard on that and, and i have been talking to a developer about um a potential uh pilot project we're looking at a, sort of a footbridge on a on a site and it, it seems to me that um, because it's new, of course, it's hard to, to get these things started. But something like a footbridge uh, is is likely to be the first thing that co comes up in the UK because it's a sort of small piece that we can bite off without uh, scaring everyone away. OK, excellent. Well, listen, thank you very much for that, Andy. That was a really excellent talk. There are, and thank you, everybody, for uh, for for listening in and for all of those questions. Uh, we will share them with Andy and he will hopefully be able to get back to you um, uh, with regards to that. And so just before we sign off, then I'd just like to um, uh, uh, give some information about the next Fresh Concrete, which is available to, to book online. That takes place in uh, pretty much a month's time from today on Wednesday, the 28th of June at one o'clock, same time. And this is on low carbon magnesium based concrete, uh, which is carbonite. And there's going to be a presentation by the founder of that innovation and Professor Thomas, um, Dr. Thomas Brook from Munich who is also a co-founder, and he'll be talking about the technology that they've been developing there. So please do uh, sign up. There's a, The link is available on the Concrete Centre and the Building Centre website for that. And uh, thank you very much again, Andy, and I look forward to uh, some exciting new developments uh, using this innovation. And um, I hope you all have a very good afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>